Hi, this is John with WesleyGospel.com. You know, if a brother is taken in a fault, restore him gently is one verse. Another verse is rebuke them sharply, you know. Either way, either way is good. Um, and I would hope that other people would do the same to me um, because I live in an encasement of flesh, which is an earth suit called a body with sinful tendencies so there are other members of the body of Christ that I respect John MacArthur I respect him believe it or not because he's so good at lordship salvation and in exposing cheap grace I absolutely despise and abominate all of his cessationism though because I believe it causes people to not have strong faith in God and ends up with this anti-supernatural deist stuff. So I have to call out on that, you know. There's another there's another person that I have a whole lot of respect for in the area of revangelism. And I'm I'm going to not name him because he's still doing so much good that I don't think it would be necessary to name him. Um and I think that if I was to name him, it would it would harm much of the work that has in the reformations that have been accomplished by him. I view him as a reformer, and I'm honestly only building on the work that he's done. One of the things that he said about preaching hell was the following. This is in a book that he published some time back. And he said, Perhaps the modern evangelist's reticence to preach that which produces fear is simply due to concern about the reaction of sinners. Some may worry that the message may be aligned with what is commonly called hellfire preaching. I believe that hellfire preaching is detrimental to the cause of the gospel. That stings. Then he said, There is a vast difference between the use of the law and the message, You're going to burn in hell if you don't accept Jesus. Understandably, the thought that he's going to hell without the use of the law to justify that fact is unreasonable to a sinner's mind. How could a God of love send a good person such as him to a place of eternal torment? Okay. Observation and practical conclusion here. And I am completely basing this off of his own personal experience in evangelism, which is far exceeded in experience in comparison with me. I mean, I he's done way more work in this area, so he, he knows better. But I'm going to take observation, I'm going to take conclusion, and I'm going to take personal experience, and I'm going to point to Scripture in church history. Number one, observation is that if... You're doing evangelism, especially street evangelism, where you get the heckler's response, okay? <clears throat> if you preach hell in a superficial manner, like, if you, if you say something like this, if you say, believe in Jesus or you're going to hell, people are going to laugh at that. Why? Because it's kind of an unreasonable statement to a person's mind um, who doesn't who doesn't really even know the Bible. It kind of is. That, that's, that's no different than saying this, believe that the United States exists or you're going to prison. It's like saying, believe in the existence of the moon, for if you do not believe in the existence of the moon, we will send you there. It's kind of unreasonable, right? And... So he's making a very important observation, okay, um, that if you do not mix the Ten Commandments with hell as you're evangelizing to get people ready for the cross, hell just doesn't make sense. And uh, so this is really, really important. We've got to drill, as evangelists, have to drill into people's minds that idolatry and fornication and adultery and blaspheming God's name and dishonoring the godly and persecuting the godly 
and uh, covetousness and murder and lying, cheating, and stealing, those things provoke God. They make God angry. They make God into an angry God. They make God the type of a God that is angry with the wicked every day, Psalm 711. Now, here's the thing. And as a result of that, hellfire and eternal punishment is the result. Unfortunately, this evangelist who I have unspeakable respect for, this evangelist whose book title I quoted to my first pastor, and he said, I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. And I left my pastor because I respected that book title so much. I respected that evangelist's teaching so much that my faith in God has been completely dependent on my faith in the existence of hell from day one. And my seeker-sensitive pastor, when I quoted this evangelist's book to him, my seeker-sensitive pastor said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. And I was like, well, it's better to trust in the Lord than it is to trust in man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this church now because you refuse to preach in, about hell. Now, this very author says, I believe that hellfire preaching is detrimental to the cause of the gospel. How could you ever say that, sir? I think what has to happen here is that we need to get back to the 18th and the 16th. I'm sorry, the 18th and the 17th century understanding of hell, of the doctrine of hell. It was called, back then, it was called the doctrine of eternal punishment. Um, and there's a really great book on this. It's called Hell Under Fire. It has chock full of bibliographies on it. It's called the doctrine of eternal punishment. The doctrine of eternal punishment is a really robu robust doctrine of hell. It explains the law and the torments of the damned together. Probably the best verse on this is Revelation 21.8, which says, The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and all and idolaters and all liars shall have their lake part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. There you have hell and the Ten Commandments being combined in one verse. And so, if hell is preached this way, it's probably calculated to produce more conviction of sin, more conviction about hell, and have a powerful influence on people's minds to repent and trust in Christ. But the practical conclusion should never be Oh, let's not preach about hell then. Let's just preach about the Ten Commandments, the Day of Judgment, and the Cross. No. We should preach about hell. And, you know, that has the mark of the Holy Spirit on it. When Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, supernatural things happened to the people in his church. And... And there were other occasions of that as well, when the doctrine of eternal punishment used to be preached in Puritan settings, um, where there would be outpourings of the Holy Spirit to seal and to confirm the word with signs following. So um, I think it's a really big error in modern evangelism to say, <clears throat> if hell can't be preached right, then let's not preach hell at all. No. No. What we should do is we should go back to what Christopher Love said in his book, Hell's Terror, and I've been making recordings of that. Wow. I'm coming under the impression that Christopher Love's book, Hell's Terror, is probably what influenced Jonathan Edwards to preach so many sermons on hell. Jonathan Edwards preached something like uh, 25 to 50 sermons on hell. Christopher Love, I think he preached something like 10 sermons on hell. So the idea of preaching a series of sermons on hell is what we're talking about here.
And a lot of it has to deal with this Revelation 21.8 type mentality where you're mixing the Ten Commandments with the torments of hell, and you're making it all make sense, making sense by linking it together. So that hell becomes reasonable. It's reasonable to go to hell, right, if you are involved in these things. If you're fearful, and fearful is meaning people who are ashamed of the gospel. Fearful and unbelieving and abominable, people who have a hateful and acrimonious bitter spirit. And murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Who can argue with that? It provokes God, that provokes an, a holy and omnipotent God, right? I mean, that is convicting. And it's more convicting to point people to the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone than just the judgment day. Although that's good too. But which is more threatening to a sinner? Burning in fire forever or sitting before God on a throne? A God who many people have been told loves them, right? And might give them a pass. Right? Lake of fire and brimstone versus sitting on the throne of judgment, which is scarier. You know, that's what got me converted when I was a 14 year old kid. It was that. I already had the law from the civil law because I was a juvenile delinquent, so I understood that part, right? When a guy talked about hell, it was fire and brimstone that gave me to, they got me into, uh, uh, into Jesus. So uh, I think it's wrong to dodge hell just because. We haven't figured out how to convey it to a sinner's mind with the moral law. Revelation 21 eight. I just got to say, that's probably the best place to preach it. To focus on the moral law mixed in with the torments of the damned. Revelation 21 eight. The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murders and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. I understand that Puritans are hard to read. It is hard to read them. I mean, these and thous and all that. But if you read the King James Version, it, you can. it's no different. I mean, if you can get used to that, you can get used to this. And um, But but other than that, I mean, there's Robert Peterson who wrote a great book called Hell Under... Tr uh, the tr Hell... Something Trial Hell, Hell by Trial. That's a great book. Um, H Henry Buis... The Doctrine of Eternal Punishment, that's a great book. Um, uh, W.G.T. Shedd, The Doctrine of Endless Punishment, uh, the first section of the biblical argument, that's a great thing. And so uh, there's some great stuff on there. I think what we need to do in evangelism is we need to get back to that. Uh, but we need to stop just focusing on Ten Commandments, Judgment Day, and the Cross. What about hell? You know, We've got to preach hell. This... This is not good. I really truly believe this does not please the Holy Spirit. We just need to preach hell properly, you know. You can't just talk about fire, worms, blackness of darkness forever. You've got to explain why they're there, right? It's because they're they refuse to believe the gospel, because they're hateful. They're 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 whoremongers. They're into witchcraft. They lie, cheat, and steal. These things provoke God, right? And then it's like a fire and brimstone. And it's reasonable that God would be mad at them because he had tried so hard to reach them through his grace. I'm going to read a section out of my, uh, my book, Gospel of Jesus Christ, Shameless Plug. I wrote a section in there along these lines. Page 28 um, and 29 and 30. There's this little section I wrote there. Those who practice lawlessness. Jesus said, those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the furnace of fire. What does this mean? Since repenting and believing in the gospel, Mark 1.15, are the necessary requirements for salvation from hell, it follows that continual impenitence and unbelief are the means by which men become damned to hell. 
the Apostle Paul said of the wicked, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He also said that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Romans 2.5, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. Those who practice lawlessness, Matthew 13, 41, are the people who stubbornly live their lives in rebellion to the Ten Commandments and every good law that God gave to mankind. They are those who do not obey the gospel or the teachings of Christ, namely, one, turning away from sinful thoughts, words, and actions, and two, placing one's faith in the atoning sacrifice of the cross of Christ for the satisfaction of the wrath of God and the forgiveness of their sins. Those who practice lawlessness refuse to repent from their sins and place their faith in the cross, and so they are anti-Christian, evil-minded enemies of God. The wicked who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast into eternal torments and be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Matthew 25, 41, 46 Romans 2, 5, 2 Thessalonians 1, 79. As you can see, I'm mixing the moral element, you know, of obedience, those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, cast into everlasting destruction. You're, 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 mixing, you're mixing disobedience to God with eternal punishment in hell in the same thought. The Apostle Paul said, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, Galatians 5, 19 to 51. So you have this huge vice list. And then they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They go to hell. There's another one in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Vice list followed up with, you're not going to have the kingdom of God, you're going to hell. Vice list, you're going to hell. And then, of course, I think this is the best one. The Apostle John said in Revelation 21, 8, the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You have a vice list, and then it's fire and brimstone. So you're still continuing to use the law in evangelism, but it's also fire and brimstone. And you're pointing to the scriptures that combine those two elements. Universalists are people who are skeptical of what Christ meant when he said, These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew twenty-five forty-six. They ask, Did Jesus really mean that sinners will be in hell for eternity, in everlasting or eternal punishment? I reply, with such great sins as these weighing down on them, in the universe of a, an eternally holy and righteous God, how could they not go away into eternal punishment? The punishment fits the abominations. Perhaps eternal punishment is not long enough. Perhaps the sins are so enormously awful and repulsive that they, have to, they really deserve eternal everlasting punishment forever and ever. But God in his mercy saw fit to only give them eternal punishment. Perhaps one eternity in the torments of hell is enough. However, after that eternity, there is always more eternity. There is no end to it. When you slight God with abominable practices such as these, against the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, Isaiah 57, 15, and you die without repenting or trusting in the Son of Mercy, don't try to tell me that the punishment doesn't fit the crimes. When you stand before Jesus' throne in judgment over your life, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Romans 9.20 It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 See, this is what I believe needs to happen in evangelism. We need to continue 
to preach repentance from disobedience to the Ten Commandments. We need to continue to preach about the Day of Judgment. We need to continue to preach about the atoning sacrifice of Christ as a penal substitution and as a moral influence over the believer. But we need to also mix hell in. Hell's been avoided. The doctrine of hell, the torments of hell. Right? The eternal gnawing worm, the never dying worm. That's what they used to call it. They used to call it the never dying worm. The never dying worm. The everlasting flames. That needs to be drilled into. And, um, and, and then we've got a full gospel presentation. But we can't, we can't just superficially talk about hell. Believe in Jesus or you're going to hell. That's superficial. Right? Compared to this, you know, this is the way the old guys used to preach it. They used to, you know, slam down vice lists and just just make the whole world guilty before God. And then, hell! You know, that's awakening. That's really awakening. And uh, that's what got me saved when I was 14 years old. And I believe it needs to continue today. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.